so welcome to the first Heidelberg Joint Astronomy Colloquium of the semester. Also welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today it's our great pleasure to have uh, Norma Murray here as our guest and our speaker. Um, and so to give a very small uh of you today, he did his PhD in Berkeley uh, in physics and nonlinear dynamics, and then went for a postdoc to Queen Mary College in London. And after that, moved to Caltech, where he actually switched to astronomy, and of course, we're very happy that he switched to astronomy. Um, and then moved uh, to CETA uh, in Toronto as a professor, where he is uh, still currently, and he's uh, the director there already for many years. Um, and so, we're very happy to have him here. And so, uh, he's going to talk about collapse and star formation in self gravitating turbulent fluids. So, let's uh, Welcome him to Highland. Thank you for the invitation and the chance to talk. Uh, I have to say, I'm surprised at how many people uh, from my neighborhood are actually here in Heidelberg, and uh, Ralph and some of the students, uh, and the number of people that like to see uh, people that produce PhD, and so it's great to, see, to be here to talk. Uh, so I do want to talk about collapse and star formation. Uh, self-gravitating turbulent fluids, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it is work that other people are, are pretty much heading in the same direction, I would say. I would not be more kind than other people. Uh, people are, I think it's a little bit of a change from what people thought star formation would work like in the past, and I'll kind of describe that hopefully in a way that people can follow me. Uh, uh, so let me just get started, a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about, uh, spend about 10 slides on the phenomenology of star formation, but I think the phenomenology as I'm sure you've seen if you've taken a course in the interstellar medium, it's usually sort of a dog's practice, right? There's a million things going on, you can't figure out what matters to what doesn't. At least I can't. Uh, but I'll tell you what I think uh, gives you clues about physics. Then I'll talk a little bit about previous uh, star formation theory, the sort of collapse models in terms of gravitation, the sort of story that I'll be pitching is a modification of the collapse picture. This is like people who read the old shoe paper from 1977. It's a long map line, can you call it also the term core model? Um, now I'll talk about the simulations that we've been doing. The simulations are not particularly uh, you know, cutting edge. I mean, people have been doing sort of things we're talking about for a long time, basically stir turbulence in a box. But the way we analyze it is different because of our understanding from the analytic theory about what we have looking for. And I think that's hopefully what is new. I'll do very briefly some comparison observations because I think. Uh, for those of you who know what we're talking about, Larson's Law, there, it's known that in massive star formations, you see deviations from that. And there has not been an explanation of the literature of what's going on there. I think you can understand actually what's happening. It's really interesting it's how you drive turbulence in gravitational collapse. It's been known for a long time that gravitational collapse could drive turbulence, but in fact, I think you're seeing the signature of it in deviations from Larson's Law. And I'll uh, finish up with some conclusions. Uh, this is supposed to be aimed at graduate students. Uh, I have a hard time pitching the level because, as I say, you're talking about the interstellar medium, it's really hard to figure out what's up and what's down. So, if you have questions, please you know, ask. All right, so the phenomenology here's a quick list. Uh, the first thing to say is that star formation really is slow on the galactic scale. Um, this is a result of you know, Martin Schmidt and Rob Kennecke many years ago. Uh, I'll point out that stars, as far as we know, form in molecular gas. I'm just having an interesting conversation this morning. Really, they form in dense gas. But in the Milky Way, people usually think of molecular gas as being dense gas. Um, obviously, gravity doesn't care about chemistry. Right? So it's really a dense gas. That matters. But usually, people trace it by moving molecules. And not hydrogen molecules, because you can't see those by much. Uh, there's a question about slow star formation on small scales. There's a claim in the literature. In the literature, even on small scales, GMC are small, the star formation rate is slow compared to the local dynamic time. I don't think that's true. I'll show you some observational evidence and then, of course, the, what happens in the simulations. The interstellar medium, I think, really is turbulent. Uh, and I'll describe Larson's laws basically, the one I think is the size line relationship, the amount of the, what I think of as turbulent motion uh, scales with the size that we look at. And then deviations from Larson Solar Gas and Star Formation. So that's we'll quickly run through that. So on the left here, it's kind of hard maybe to read the labels, but that's okay. 
Uh, this is the star formation rate per unit area. This is from Kennecott's uh, 98 paper. Uh, and on the x-axis there is the gas surface density. density so this really is just gas, not like the electron. Divided by the dynamical time, which in Rob's case meant the, the circular velocity of the galaxy in question divided by the half-life radius. And that's normally, if you assume the disk is a hydrostatic equilibrium, which isn't a terrible approximation, that, that also means the local dynamical time of the disk. Okay. And uh, uh, that's just dimensional analysis, right? Uh, some gas or mass surface density divided by time, that's the star formation rate, and on the bottom is a gas surface density divided by dynamic time. You expect those two to be correlated. Gravity is important in star formation. And they are correlated when they have a slope that's basically one. Uh, but the funny bit is, as a sort of indicator, you can't see it way down here. You'd expect the sort of relationship of that number to be order unity if gravity was really important. And, and the number is 0 0.02, 0 0.017. Okay, so that means the time it takes to turn gas in a disk into stars is sort of 50 dynamical times, which seems kind of odd. If gravity is causing things to collapse, why does it take 50 times the free fall? Right, so that's why people say that star formation is slow on galactic scales. Now, I think the answer, the reason for this is feedback. Okay, um, But I want to make sure that you know, it isn't due to turbulence, just holding the gas forever somehow, or magnetic fields or something else. And that's why I want to do simulations to check and see if I don't have any feedback, what does the star formation look like? The right one is just a more recent paper by Adam Leroy and Cuppin. I think Frank is also on here. Um, Cuppin, the, in, his, in their case, the star formation efficiency, which means an inverse time to them. And the time, the point is that the time scale is sort of several kb years to bring a gas. Okay, which is many times the dynamical time. So it makes the same point as the plotting of that, just a different way. It's also measured on somewhat smaller scales. Okay, now just as an aside, I'll point out that star formation isn't just slow, it's also inefficient. If you take the gas in, that you expect to be associated with dark matter halos, uh, very, a small fraction of it turns into stars. Okay, that's shown most clearly in the right hand plot that's from Stacey McGon's paper. If you take the amount of baryons that you think are inside a given imperial halo, uh, maybe 20-25% of them at the peak turn into stars. That's around sort of L-star galaxies like the Milky Way. Uh, and if you look on halos that are more massive or less massive, basically the gas doesn't turn into stars very well. That is not, a, uh, it's not related directly to the slow time scale for star formation. There's plenty of time to turn on the gas into stars. And there's something else going on to make that happen. I won't talk much about that, but again, that's, I think, due to feedback, it's ejecting gas out of galaxies. Now, here I say stars form in giant molecular clouds, which I think is a true statement. It doesn't matter that they're molecular or not, but it's in these big clumps of gas in the Milky Way. So here's just two maps of the Milky Way. The top one is a classic Dane map of the CO emission in the, in the galaxy. And the bottom one is, is a map that I made using the W map, free free emission. And the idea here is that they're slightly different scales, but you get the idea that, right, this is free free emission down here in the plane. This is essentially the, what people call the three kiloparsec ring. It's sort of more like a five kiloparsec ring. That's where most of the star formation in the Milky Way takes place. And that's where the molecular gas is as well. There's other places like here you can see a bit of star formation corresponding to dense molecular gas. So the idea is that, in fact, yeah, stars do form in molecular gas. I always point this out because I think it's amusing. There's a bit of star formation here. That turns out to be one star, Zeta, or Eta, Zeta, Ophiuchus. It's about 100 parsecs of radius, producing free free emission locally. There's not much CO. Okay. Uh, just for those of you, anybody have an idea what that one is down there? It's the LMC. SMC. You didn't actually see that one. All right, so uh, as I say here, there is turbulence in the ISM. Um, on the left plot here, I'm showing um, the velocity dispersion. Basically, you can measure CO. You've got a, a line width that you, you can measure for a given object on the sky. For that same object, you can measure its size and some description of it. They're not particularly round objects, but you pick some you know, measurement of the size. And this is a measurement that we did on uh, Mark Van the Village. It's not out yet, but this is using the Dane survey. And you can see that there is a correlation between the size of 
of what we call a GMC, and uh, it's lined up. And this is just redoing what Larson did. And we got a similar pop up here. The velocity version was like the size to RD's 0.41. Most people get it closer to a half. On the right hand side, I'm showing the, the variable parameter, which is a measure of how gravitationally bound these objects are. And that's broken up into things that are in the inner galaxy and the outer galaxy. And you can see it's, it's peaked around a variable parameter of order one, meaning they're sort of marginally gravitationally bound. There's a lot of objects that are clearly not gravitationally bound, there's some that seem to be very bound. That's basically a, a measurement of the errors in how you, how you obtain the language of the size. Okay. Um, the ones that are tend to be gravitationally bound are the most massive clouds. The smaller clouds tend to be unbound. Okay. So this is trying to address the question, is the star formation, we know the star formation is slow on the galactic scale, how about on a smaller scale? So this is, there are two plots here on the left, here's from Krumholtz and Tan in 2007. And they were trying to make the argument that the star formation rate is slow, again, it's compared to the three-fold time for local gas. And they were saying that even a very high density gas, you can't read this, but this is, uh, this is 10 to the 2, I think, and this is 10 to the 4, 5, 6, or something like that. So over a wide range of density, so zooming in the smaller, smaller regions, that the star formation rate, very good again, I wasn't touching it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are getting another projector just in case. Uh, okay. Uh, and their, their claim was it was small on all scales, and it was always around 1%. Not, not, well, the error parts are big, but not a huge amount of scattered. On the right, we did the same thing, uh, again, using the survey of the Galactic Plane that Mark Antoine uh, did. Uh, it was a Dame survey on the molecular clouds. So we measured the same quantity, the star formation rate for free fall time is defined here, essentially. Okay. Um, and we see a huge range of star formation rate. And the way we did this is well, we did two different ways of measuring the star formation. We used either the free free emission for the W map, or we used the far infrared emission uh, from IRAS, actually. He's done it with Plunk as well, but that is publicly available. And it looks the same. You can see this huge range of star formation rates from 10 to minus 4 per free fall time up to about more than a tenth. Okay? So there's a huge range, huge scatter. So it's not like there's some well defined small star formation rate, it's a huge scatter. That actually goes back to this old paper by Mooney and Solomon in the 80s where they saw the same thing. They had a range which wasn't quite as big as this, but they had a few objects. So there's a huge scatter. All right, so I think that's a clue that something's going on. Is that the plot? Um, so I put up these two plots to show that, so uh, for example, on the left, it's showing, again, the size line with relation that I showed you earlier from the Milky Way. Uh, and there's a dash line there, which is the Larson's version of it going through a bunch of Milky Way points. But if you look at massive star forming regions, you'll get things that are up here that have much too high alignment for their um, size. And on the right hand side is an old paper by uh, Rene Plume and Company, which makes the same point. So the, on the upper panel on the right hand side there, the points are what they measured as the, the line width as a function of radius. And they compare that to the Larson relation, which is that sort of dashed line at the bottom there. So they give rays that have limits that are way too large. And this is sort of, it's a big clue that something's going on because turbulence is supposed to be universal. If you stir it on large scales, you get power on small scales because of a turbulent cascade. That should follow some sort of power law relation. And if you see regions where the turbulence is much higher, either it's being driven locally by some source like supernova, or there's something else going on. And I'll try to make a case that there's a good explanation for this based just on the gravitational collapse in these massive star forming regions. The other thing I'll say is that on the bottom here, this is a plot of um, the line width again, but this time versus the number density of the gas. Now they didn't actually resolve these sources, but they're using different molecular tracers, and they, they claim to be able to map from the type of molecular tracer you're seeing to a density. So that's what they're plotting along the bottom there. And this really puzzled them. That one was a result that other people had seen. But this one's kind of weird because it says that as you go to higher densities, the line width here gets bigger. And normally, right, if you have a star from a region, higher densities means smaller radii. And the smaller radii, you expect the line width to get smaller, but they're seeing it get bigger. Okay? All right. So that's sort of 10 or 15 minutes. This is Pick it up a little bit here, the star formation theory. I want to quickly go through this. If, if I go too fast, um, you know, go ahead and slow me down. I don't have to get through all the talk. 
Um, now, what I want to talk about is that, you know, if you think the star formation is slow on small scales, like come up to town or arguing, then that actually explains why star formation is small on large scales, right? You can't make stars anywhere fast, and you don't need anything to explain the large scale. You just add up a bunch of small scale star formation regions. They all go slow, so the whole thing goes slow. On the other hand, if star formation is rapid on small scales, then you need some excuses to why on larger scales you get a small star formation. Okay? So you do want to understand on small scales what's going on. Is star formation slow or isn't it? And if it is slow, then what's making it slow? So there's a number of potential reasons for this. So one is thermal pressure support. You hold gas up at high heat. At some level, this is what Frank Shi was talking about. Uh, then a little later, people talked about magnetic pressure support. You know, the gas is molecular, but it's not completely neutral. It's a bit of ionization. That'll couple to magnetic fields. If you have magnetic fields that are strong enough, they'll exert pressure to try to compress the gas. And that'll keep it from collapsing. You can just say that, you know, you see these turbulent alignments, maybe that'll hold the gas up. Okay. If you're flying around a plane and the turbulence comes on, you get bounced around, that acts a little bit like a pressure, maybe that'll keep it. Um, so again, that was assuming hydrostatic equilibrium. So Ralph uh, was one of the people who worked this out. Um, there is just a, another theory which I'll briefly go into that just turbulence by itself explains why star formation is slow. Um, it's a turbulent fragmentation model. Um, I'm also key, but it was actually uh, suggested earlier that I had one of them. And then on the other hand, if star formation turns out to be fast on small scales, then you need some other excuse for making a small galaxy. And I think the answer to that, I won't give you any evidence for this, but it's pretty clearly to do that. Okay, so now I want to spend a little bit of time doing a bit of, well, physics. Maybe this is, this is kind of too busy, but just to give you an idea of the flavor of what's going on here. So this, was, this is the sort of approach that Larson used uh, in Kenston. And then there's a long, you know, sort of history Frank Chu's model, then Myers and Fuller, etc. There's a list up there. Using this sort of an argument for how star formation proceeds, okay? So basically what they did, all these people, they had two equations that they were solving and an auxiliary one. So the first one is just conservation of mass. And usually these models are strictly symmetric. So that's the top equation there. The second equation is just the momentum equation. Okay? And this term here, the third term there, is a pressure gradient term. I've just put in a term of velocity. I said the pressure is proportional to rho v turbulent squared. When uh, Larson and Penston and, and Chu originally did this, they used the sound speed rather than the turbulent velocity. But as uh, Myers and Fuller pointed out, you know, in these regions, the line up is much bigger than the thermal line up, and if that is due to pressure, that's the dominant term. Okay. And the last term here is just expressing the mass enclosed inside a given radius. It's just the integral of density. Okay. So that's how the m uh, on the second equation there, it's replaced by the density. So there's two equations and two unknowns that you can solve that, okay? Now the way to solve, going back to Larson, is to assume homology, homology right? They, they pick a similarity variable, which is the ratio of a, a, the radius to some velocity, or something with the units of velocity, times the time, okay? Sometimes it was taken to be just a time-dependent term, and sometimes it was taken to be a radius dependent Okay, depending on who, who the author was. All right? I want to point out that, and, and if it was a turbulent velocity, it was assumed, you know, the top turbulence was given to you by God, right? We know the Larson's like, that's what it is, okay? Now, it turns out this assumption forces both the infall velocity, well, it forces the infall velocity to be a monotonic function of the radius. And of course, it was already assumed that the turbulence was a monotonic function. Of velocity. And that's, it looks like an innocent mathematical assumption, but it actually forces the physical solution to be incorrect. Okay? I'll just point out Larson and Penson, they, they assumed that the infall velocity went to zero with small radius, and Chu said that doesn't sound like a sensible solution. It ought to be that the velocity goes to some large value of small radius, and the rest of the people after took that same solution. Okay? Now, by picking either a, a sound speed here for this turbulent velocity, in which case P is zero, or a Larson's law type solution, that, that enforces that the pressure gradient term vanishes compared to the gravity term as you go to small radius. Okay. 
And what I argue is that that doesn't actually happen. That in real life, the pressure term is always comparable to the uh, acceleration of gravity. I'll try to explain why that is. Now, these models all started at or near hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay? So, since they were assuming in the, in the later years that the pressure was proportional to rho v turbulent squared, I won't go through the math, but you can sort of see it yourself. Um, if you're assuming near hydrostatic equilibrium, that's this equation here. So you drop the velocity gradient terms in the momentum equation. Uh, if you just do scaling these things, or uh, putting rho v turbulent squared here, it says that the turbulent square of the turbulent velocity goes scales as r squared times rho. All right. And uh, if you put in Larson's law, that tells you how the density has to scale in hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay. So that's what the turbulent core model. Um, then in Shu's solution and, and the models that fall, you can get the mass accretion rate by saying that you have an inside out collapse, right? If you somehow cause the pressure to decrease on the inside, the gas that's been sitting in hydrostatic equilibrium above that after a while realizes, wait a minute, the bottom's dropped out, it starts to fall in. That information, the radius at which that happens, that just travels that through the sound speed in Shu's model or the turbulent velocity in the later models. And that tells you the expansion radius scales like t to the 1 over 1 minus p. Remember, p is the Larson's law exponent. And uh, that result, which is used in all the papers, that assumes self similarity, meaning that these things are just straight power laws. And again, I'll argue that they're not actually straight power laws. In particular, the turbulent velocity is not straight power laws. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the argument for the similarity solutions is just there's no characteristic scale of the problem. That's correct. Then that's true of gravity, and then people thought that was a good assumption for turbulence in the very case. Well, the turbulence, if you ignore the original turbulence was inferred in the air stopping in Larson, it was like down to the 70. It looked like a straight power law. So that, again, has no scale associated with it. Now, there is, a, there is an outer scale with gravity turbulence, which is not actually that well established what it is. And then, of course, there's also a scale, there's two scales. There's one when the class progresses far enough to form a star. So that gives you another scale of stellar radius. But even before that, you'll form a disk, and I'll show you that in the simulations. So that will give you another scale. So there's, but the disk scales typically are 100 or 1,000 AU. Then the outer scale for the turbulence is believed to be something like the scale of that. So we'll call it 100 parsecs. So between 100 parsecs and you know, 1,000 AU, there's a lot of room. So that part of the scale for you actually makes sense. right? You've got well, 100 parsecs is 10 to the 20. And 1,000 AU is 10 to the 16. So you got at least four decades. So you know, then it wouldn't surprise you have a scaling relation. But I'll point out there is another length scale for the problem. Uh, Mark has asked me what was I going to say about the shoe solutions. Yeah, the next slide. Yeah, that was the next slide. So uh, I really like that paper. It's a great paper. So what I want to point out on the shoe solution was that he said, so Larson and Preston both realized there was a critical point in those two solutions. Um, and they, they picked a solution that had zero velocity at small radius. And they wanted to have a high velocity, large radius. And they realized, and they, and they wanted the solution to go through the critical point. And Shu said, well, I think that's the way it works. First of all, you should have high velocity, small radius. But secondly, he didn't like solutions that went through the critical point. Because if you ask for the velocity to be small inside and to go through the critical point, what you ended up getting was solutions that went in at small radius and out at large radius, which didn't seem like a good prescription for star formation. So I think that was actually very sensible. Um, he did, however, have one particular solution that didn't quite go through a critical point, but it was tangent to a critical point. And that was his expanding collapse wave solution. And that was hydrostatic, a large radius, no velocity at all, and then essentially free fall as you approach the center. And in between, the gas was accelerating. And that he went into free fall because as you went to small velocity, small radius, the uh, gas pressure term relative to the gravity term vanished. This is from Chu's paper. The expanded collapse solution I was talking about was this one, the solid curve. This dot dashed line is the line of similar solutions. Uh, and Chu would like things that went high velocity at small radius and low velocity at large radius. So his solutions that he liked were these solid lines were like this. So in fall all the way. That's a, re a perfectly physically reasonable model. <laughs> and then the solution you kind of realize is that you could understand physically what's going on. It's this particular limiting case. 
where you were in hydrostatic equilibrium at large radius, and then here you're starting to notice the way that the pressure is dropping on the inside here. And that turn, that ends up with yourself in the first okay. The larson penson solution is down here. Okay, it starts at zero velocity, zero radius, and it curves this way and it crosses that line of singularities out here. But you can see the, the velocity, well, it's got funny properties, which you can read Chu's paper to find out why we didn't think they were useful. Okay. All right, so I'll point out in this solution. Uh, in these class models, the turbulence was not a dynamical variable. It was just fixed. Okay? And then you can work out what the accretion rate is because, um, as I said, if you start out in hydrostatic equilibrium, you can fix the run of the turbulent velocity. That tells you the run of density. Ralph Link coming the McLaughlin worked this out. Uh, and that gives you that the mass on the central logic, the, the stellar mass, increases at some power law. So I like to write it. Larson's index in there because that's physical to me. But they give in terms of this gamma parameter, which is the polytropic index. And in those uh, models, in, in, the, in the key and tan models, that, that was just taken from observations. Okay. And as I said, asymptotically is pressure free. Okay. Right. So I better be moving along here. So what I did with Phil Chang after looking at a number of simulations is. Um, well, first of all, I think observation is not so clear, but I don't think the star formation is not generally high density people living. People have been really biased by looking at low mass star formation in the neighborhood and, and seeing things that look like they're in high density people living. But I think if you look at massive star formation regions, there's not much evidence for that. Okay, now the other thing that you really have to do is you have to treat the turbulence as a dynamical variable. It evolves with time during the collapse. So that means you need an energy equation to do this analytically, or you have to do a 3D hydro calculation. Well, present in a second. Now, for the analytic theory, which we did first, actually, we used a prescription from this paper by Robinson and Goldman, which they called adiabatic heating of turbulence. And, and this, I thought, was a really clever thing, typical Peter Goldman, to be honest. Uh, so the idea is, you know, in molecular physics, if you compress something, you'll adiabatically heat a gas. If you expand it, you'll adiabatically cool the gas. And he just made an analogy between, you know, molecules and turbulent eddies, which is an old analogy goes back to way before Peter. But the idea was if you compress gas, a turbulent gas, you'll drive turbulence. And if you expand it, you'll, you'll cause the turbulence to decay. And they, they gave a nice heuristic argument for why this ought to work and how. And then they actually gave an expression for how to calculate the turbulent velocity depending on the rate which you're expanding and collapsing the gas. And then they checked this with numerical simulation, which I'll show in a second. But they, they put in a scale factor, like a cosmological uh, model, and just adjusted the scale parameter to, to whatever they wanted to be and watch what happened to the turn points. Okay. So here's just a plot I stole from their paper and it's kind of hard to read, but basically it's showing as a function of the scale parameter A, okay, what the turbulent velocity looks like. And the idea was they could have a decay, they could have an increase, or they could make an increase in the decay just by choosing their the variations in their scale parameter. Okay, so the turbulence was being driven or damped depending on how the, how the universe in their simulation was expanding or contracting. Okay, so this universe is kind of funny. Uh, first you drive the turbulence and then you cause it to decay. And that's a funny variation of the scale parameter as it the function of time. Uh, and the equation they gave is, is something like this. And the idea here is that um, if there's no infall velocity, um, the turbulent velocity just decays because it's observed. Actually, Mark, Mark kind of close when people do this. You know, if you have turbulence in a box, you expect it to decay. And numerical simulations show that that's the case, and it tends to decay roughly on the eddy turbulent time. Um, so that's one term in this equation. The other term is if you have infall velocity, this uh, <coughs> ur U -R over r looks like the um, Hubble parameter, if you like. And that will actually drive or, or um, damp the turbulence depending on the sign of the UR. So if UR is negative and things collapse and drive turbulence and it's positive, it'll, it'll cause it to decay even faster. All right. So if you use that, you can actually analytically work out what will happen. All right. Um, but I'll point out before we get to that, that if you do this, you'll realize pretty quickly there is actually another scale in the problem. Okay? Which I'll call the uh, sphere of influence. So if you form a star or a star cluster, 
it's got a certain amount of mass locked up in stars. That, that mass doesn't produce an equivalent pressure, okay, where it's supposed to, if you have a gas distribution, it will produce a pressure. Um, so there is, a, there is a sphere of influence where the stellar mass is comparable to or bigger than the, the gas mass enclosed in the gate radius around. So that's what this thing's trying to say. There's a stellar mass, which we think is going to be a function of time since you're creating mass. This is the gas mass around the star. If you integrate it up to a given radius I call R star here, so that this integral is equal to the stellar mass enclosed, then that's sort of the radius at which the stellar mass is dominating the gas mass. Inside of there, the gas doesn't contribute to the gravity particularly. It's dominated by the star. And you'd expect things to behave differently inside that radius than outside that radius. Okay? So in other words, there is a scale in the problem once you form a star that's given by this radius, okay? And that's very quickly bigger than the disk radius that you form, and it's going to be less than the diving radius of the turbulence. So now you can see that you don't expect a simple power law in a collapsed solution, okay? This doesn't depend on turbulence or anything else. It's just a scale that was missed when people analyze these equations, okay? And I'll show that the numerical solutions do see it. This do see the scale pretty clearly. And it explains that turnaround in the turbulent velocity that's inferred from the measurements of plume et al., where the density is increasing and the length is increasing. Okay? There's another model, so that's, that's a modified model I'm going to compare it to, which is basically a collapse model like everybody else's, but it's, but it's treating the turbulent velocity as a dynamic variable. There's another model called the turbulent fragmentation model, which sort of doesn't have any dynamics in it at all at some level. Okay? And the idea is that. If you look at turbulent simulations, the density is log normally distributed, at least if there's no self gravity. Uh, the idea was then to pick some critical density. If you go to high enough density, the idea is that that will overcome, the self gravity will overcome any sort of pressure. So you pick some critical density, and you say, okay, above that density, all the gas will collapse on a free fall time. <coughs> and say that um, you know, that will produce a certain star formation rate. That very high density tail in log normal distribution has to get. Um, once you collapse this gas and you've got some vacuum around the stars, you're going to have to replace that high density gas by some sort of turbulent process, which uh, is sometimes, but not always, taken to be a large scale dynamical time. In that case, you get a star formation which scales linearly with time just by construction. So, this is the um, Krumholtz and McLean uh, model. All right, so so to sort of illustrate that, there's a density probability distribution function. This one's from Fitzsack et al., which I think is a great paper. Now these guys did include self-gravity, so initially before they turned the self-gravity, t equals zero, that red line is the log normal distribution, which a lot of people get. This was an AMR calculation, so they could fall into quite high densities. They turn on the gravity, and this power law tail, which is here in green and then in blue, grows out of it. And then you can see it goes over several decades in density. And then there's another break here. And they pointed out that this break is occurring because uh, the gas, as it collapses, has some finite angular momentum. And eventually it forms a disk on the inside. And this is the disk. Okay. Very nice, beautiful result. So to illustrate what Cromwell and McHugh were talking about, they made this assumption. First of all, they didn't pay any attention to power law tails. I should say, I think actually the first person to see these tails was sitting here. Um, what they did is they said, okay, everything above some critical density, which I took to be this black curve, because it's going to be a lot of down, that will turn into stars in a local dynamic time. And then you replace that gas by the turbulence, you know, making shocks, producing shocks, which increase the density and refill this on a large scale dynamic time. That gives you the star formation. Okay. All, right. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the simulations that we did and explain you know, what works and what doesn't compared to these analytic models. Now I should stress, of course, these are simulations. I'll describe how what they include, which isn't a hell of a lot of physics. And I'll talk about these results as if they were what you see in real life. They are, right? So you've got to keep that in mind. They probably give you some clues to what's going on. So this is sort of a standard picture of what we did is we took a 16 parsec box of periodic boundary conditions and we stirred it turbulently. We just did an isothermal gas. <coughs> Okay, so no energy equation, well, T equals constants in the energy equation. And uh, then we did it for a long time until the situation settled down. We picked it, we adjusted the driving, turbulent driving is some complete bogus prescription, right? We just force things in random linear Fourier space on large scales. Uh, and, and you form these telemetry structures. 
after you let self rot, you turn on self gravity, and the ability for the stuff to turn into stars and make single particles. And you get a picture that looks like this. Okay. So this is very standard. This has been done for at least 10 years, maybe 20. Right? And on the right side is just to zoom in around one of these red spots. And you can see what's going on here. There's little arrows which are supposed to indicate you know, the velocity. And your form, this, this is uh, 10 to minus 2 parsecs here. So this is 5 by 10 to minus 2. So this is a real zoom in on one of these things. And you can see there's stuff screaming in, and it swirls around and makes a little disc. But you also see there are funny shocks here and so forth. Right? This is sort of a very classic standard picture. So what we did was just to analyze this a bit differently. You know? Time. But very quickly, what we did was say, uh, despite the fact that there are filamentous structures here, it turns out that the mass accretion onto these regions is roughly spherical. Okay? So a lot of the gas is actually coming in through regions like this, where the density is low, but it turns out the velocity of the windfall is high. So if you look at the accretion rate around here, it covers most of the sky, actually. If you ask her, you know, what fraction of the sky do you need to build up half the accretion, it's like half the sky. So even though there's these filamentous structures, the accretion is roughly spherical. So we just said, we did an analysis, set it on either a density maximum before any star particles form, or around the star particle itself, and just calculated, first of all, the, the mean density of the gas, and not the mean density, it's the mean velocity of the gas, because the gas, these, these filaments are moving around. So we subtract that away, so we're in the center of mass motion of the star, or the lower density peak. Then we measured, calculated the accretion, sorry, the impulse velocity through a spherical shell, and we subtracted that from the velocity of each cell, so mass weighted uh, infall velocity. We subtract that from each cell in the shell. And then we subtract the, we calculate the angular momentum in the shell, okay, and treat it as if it were, were rotating uniformly, so we calculate the moment of inertia. And that gives you a mean uh, rotational velocity. We subtract that from, from the velocity of each cell. And what's left over, we just call the turbulent velocity. Okay. And then you can break that turbulent velocity into the in and out, the radial motion v theta or v phi. v theta is up and down, v phi is around. So you can actually calculate the term of velocity in each of the three directions. Okay. So the plots that I can be showing the velocity are calculated that way. Uh, so very quickly, we were doing, this was using flash. We originally started using Enzo when we were having difficulties, so we switched over using flash. We did have many levels of refinement. We started off with a 16 parsec box, stirred turbulence, isothermal, as I said. Uh, we've been doing runs with magnetic fields. They, they do have an effect, but it's not really dramatic. I won't talk much more about that. OK, so quickly, the results. Well, I already showed you one. You get filamentary structure. That's not new. The clump size, it turns out, is related to the outer scale of the turbulent driving. Right? If you make a bigger scale for the turbulent driving, you get bigger infall regions, and you get bigger clumps. That's not real surprising. What we did see is that we never found a region where you have massive star formation going on, that they were ever in hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay. We saw the disk form first and then a star. That's maybe not particularly surprising either. If you look at large scales, we do recover large than the size line population with a power of a half, not 0.4. Um, and we see deviations from it in collapsing regions. And I would say that, in other words, we see adiabatic heat. <coughs> okay, we have no feedback, so that's not what it is. Uh, we find an attractor for the density profile. Okay, if you're inside that sphere of influence of a star, the density is not time dependent, it's fixed. That's a really surprising, nice result, which you can actually get analytically. I first saw it analytically in the DC simulations, I'll show you. And as I said before, the pressure gradient is comparable to, or actually bigger than, the acceleration of gravity if you're outside the sphere of influence of the stars. And it's slightly less than the, sphere, the acceleration due to gravity if you're inside the sphere of influence. Okay? And that happens, this second one in particular happens because of a nonlinear feedback loop in the equations. Right? The idea is as the gas falls in, if the pressure gradient is less than that of gravity, the acceleration due to the pressure gradient term, then the gas will accelerate. Okay? As, it, as it accelerates, you actually drive the turbulence harder. So there's a, a feedback loop through the equations of motion that tune the turbulent velocity to be comparable to the infall velocity. And I'll, I'll go through that. The other thing is that at small radii, this is again a not a new result. You know, you're feeding these discs at a quite high velocity, high mass accretion rate, like 10 minus 3 solar masses a year. So 
So after a little while, you pile them up and they become gravitationally unstable. The two meter cube parameter gets to be order unity or less. And you get spiral arms in the disk, they dump a bunch of material on the star, and then Q goes to be bigger than one, and you start climbing mass up in the disk again, and you get this sort of, not a cycle, but it's an intermittent, you dump material on the star. But on average, the mass accretion rate through the disk is just determined to be equal to the mass accretion rate on the disk when they fall. Okay? So quickly some results. This is in a paper on the archive, so you can look at these yourself so you don't have to listen to me. But so here is a region which you can see is in a filament. It's going to turn into a star in about 100,000 years. So in the dynamical time of the box is about 3.8 years. So this is not too many dynamical times before the star forms. It's kind of hard to trace it back to the block part. So there's the density contrast. You can see it's in a filament, but it's not particularly high density peak yet. But this is, I'm going to show you a bunch of plots like this. So here's the radius in parsecs. Long, and this is a bunch of different velocities. This red dotted line here is just the square root of g times the enclosed mass, including the stellar mass if there is any, which in this case there is isn't. Like over r, okay, so the Keplerian velocity. The green line is the turbulent velocity, calculated as I said earlier. The blue line is the infall velocity, and these black dotted things are the, are the mean rotational velocity of the shells. Okay? So the point is here, this is long before a star forms. Infalls, this, this solid line is a sound speed. Okay. So the infall here, this is a region where gas is coming in from around the parsec. Remember, we're driving it with k equals 2, so on a scale it's about half of the 16 parsecs, but it's randomly driven. So this particular region where the star forms, there's, a, there's an infall region which is about a parsec in size, and that's why the infall velocity drops off. Okay, but you can see the turbulent velocity. If you go large radii, it, it is more or less large than solid, but here it's much flatter. And already, this is before a star forms. The infall is driving the turbulence, so you get a lot more, a lot higher turbulent velocity than you would expect from Mars's law. Right. And that's, as I say, well before a star forms. So a little bit later, the same object. <laughs> now you can see you're starting to get. It's still before the star forms, right? So there's a disk forming in here. The densities are getting really high. Um, so you get a disk, a rotational disk. You can see the black dot line here goes up like that inside. And it's reaching that square root of GM over R. So this disk is already partially rotationally supported. Okay, but it's quite thick disk because you can see the green line is also comparable to the rotational velocity. In other words, the turbulent velocity is comparable to the circular velocity. So this is a pretty thick disk. Okay. But again, this is before a star form. So you can see now the infall velocity is supersonic all the way from some reasonable fraction of the parsec. And getting to be quite high here, um, comparable to the, it's never less than, say, a third of the Keplerian velocity, a quarter of the free fall velocity. So that's not hydrostatic equilibrium. This is before, again, before it star forms. Okay. This is just another, uh, this is, I should say, the same plot on the two sides, but at a time after the star forms. Um, and it's getting some complicated behavior here. And you can see what's going on. You have a couple streams coming in here. So, you know, but look at this, the velocity is decreasing, the turbulent velocity is decreasing, and then the increasing which you go in. And that's the sphere of influence of the star. I should go back even earlier. Before the star forms, the disk also doesn't provide much gas pressure. So the sphere of influence of the disk is here. But as the thing grows, that, that sphere of influence grows out, and you can see the place at which the velocity switches over from decreasing to increasing the turbulent velocity. It goes out with time. And you can also see that the infall velocity you know, approaching, but not quite the Keplerian velocity, is the rate, the place at which that happens also moving. Okay, so this is that other scale I was talking about. So there are two solutions, two self similar solutions, one outside the sphere of influence, which is this, and one inside, which is given by this. All right, and that was missed in these earlier analyses because they assumed a homologous solution. All right. Now, that's another another uh, location where it started. So I was just showing you the infall velocity can extend out to pretty far, three parsecs in this case. And there it's decreasing as you come in. And the reason for that, again, is that the pressure gradient out here is actually larger. The pressure gradient term is larger than south of the gas. So you're decreasing the infall velocity, and then it starts to increase again here when you're inside the circuit. So All right, so here's just showing that the density goes to an attractor. Okay, so this, on the left here, 
these two lines are before the star forms, these are after the star forms, these are uh, avengers. And the idea is that this density, in, inside of about a tenth of a parsec, the time scale from here to here is many, many local freefall times. That's a, you know, about a freefall time out here. Um, you'll notice one region where it does actually start to grow here, inside of this radius, that's the disk radius. Okay, so what's going on there is this uh, attractor is doesn't dominate the disk dynamics. What's going on here is that the stellar mass is growing. It's going from one to four solar masses here. And the disk grows along with it, of course, right? Because to be gravitationally unstable, the disk has to be about, say, a third of the stellar mass. So the total density inside the disk will increase with time. But outside of that, and inside of the sphere of influence, the density doesn't change with time. So that actually already tells you what the mass accretion rate is going to be. Right. The density is fixed in time. The mass accretion rate is 4 pi r squared rho times the infall velocity. The infall velocity is just given by the square root of g times the mass of the star divided by r, because you're inside the sphere of influence. So dm dt is proportional to the square root of m. And m is the only time m star. And that's the only time you can determine that the density is the only time it can exist. So that means that the accretion rate has to go like t squared. Well, the accretion is total accretion mass, that's what I squared accretion is. Okay. So this is just a plot showing that in fact, not with great precision, but this is the ratio of the gas pressure gradient term to the uh, gravity term. It's somewhat larger than one outside the sphere of influence and it's slightly less than one inside. So you should have the infall velocity decreasing out here and increasing in here. And on the right hand side, I'm just showing the two make Q, this is zoomed in where the disk is. And it's a border unity and it bounces around a lot. Okay? Alright. This is making the point that I mentioned in words here earlier. This is the mass accretion rate inside the sphere of influence, the self this And the solution says it ought to be constant, but here's the disk radius somewhere here. You can see it's a little low there. If I show it to you later, it would actually be a little higher. On average, it turns out to be just this accretion rate. Not surprising. And here's the stellar mass as a function of time. Then it sort of starts off and grows, and then it starts to go into power law, and that's t squared right there. Okay. Now that result is also not new. That's been seen in a lot of simulations, again, for 10 years. Most people dismissed it and said it's a transfer. And I don't think that's the right attitude to take. This is actually telling you what's going on in the dynamics. It's a result of that. The tractor and the density times the fact that you're inside the sphere of influence of the star. <coughs> That says that the mass has to grow like t squared. Now, of course, this will stop when you've eaten some reasonable fraction of the gas in the box. It has to stop. Um, or if there's feedback. But this is the dynamics of what's going on. Okay. All right, now I'm really running out of time. So I'll just skip that over. You can read about, we haven't tried to make this thing really, we haven't pushed it to make observational comparisons. But basically, I'm making the point that I think this is the explanation for the reasons for why Larson's law shows deviations of small radii is because the infall motion in these massive star forming regions is being converted into turbulent energy. Partly in the infall, if you see the velocity increasing, but partly in the turbulent motions. Uh, and that will explain why the line width increases with the increasing density. You're looking at gases inside the sphere of influence of the star or star cluster. Okay. And this you can check, of course, in the law. So I put in a proposal already to do that, which didn't get any time. Somebody else will do it, right? Uh, so, I'll go through the conclusions why it's the same as for you. Did I get my work? Okay, I got my work. So, very quickly. So, what we did is we performed and analyzed turbulently stirred isothermal self governing gas simulations, right? So, the actual simulations were not new, they were not anything unusual. The analysis was different than what's been, been done in the past, because we were looking for certain results to see if they were actually correct. Um, the first result is that these simulated massive star from regions that we saw were never at minus 70 degrees. Okay. I'm pretty sure people already knew that at some level. Okay. Well, some people knew that at some level. High density gas is replaced on a, uh, a few times the local free fall time, contrary to the turbulent climate condition. In other words, you know, you're removing high density gas and putting it in stars, but it's being replaced instantaneously. Um, and they clearly show the effects of this stellar sphere. The turbulent core model can't recover this because it assumes a similar power law. Right? It doesn't know about that scale. 
And the really surprising thing to me was, in fact, that the density is fixed in time. Okay? Now, what that means is if you think that that power law distribution of density, you call that a clump. The clump was much longer than the local free fall time. Okay, so people try to often infer, okay, we've got a clump, we see a run of density, it's free fall time is us, and so it can't be any older than that. That's just not true. Two, the collapse IO claim drives turbulence. And that's modeled well by 85 feet. We didn't model it in our simulations with 85 feet, we just did the simulations. And we do see this increase of the turbulent velocity. It decreases coming in, in other words, this is a positive power if you're outside the sphere of influence, and it has a negative power, so it increases inward if you're inside the sphere of influence. And I think, as I say, that does explain those deviations from Larson's law. The infall velocity inside the sphere of influence is also the same power. The turbulence slows, it's always, the turbulent pressure is always comparable to the force of gravity, the acceleration of the turbulence is comparable to G, but it doesn't hold the collapse. Okay. The mass increases like T squared, and this can't last for very long. If it does, you know, most of the gas in the clouds like happens when we turn the stars, and you don't see that as far as I can tell. So, so you need something else to do that, and I think the obvious answer for that is to that. So I guess that's my conclusion on the thing there. Uh, you can see the picture there of what I think of selling to Okay, thanks a lot.
first start, uh, you don't get much cream. So the, there's, a, there's a long delay time. There's not many stars around, but there's a lot of gas. So normally that would be the stuff down here. And then over time, uh, you know, if you have GMC, the mass may be increasing or decreasing instead of just uh, the larger scale behaviors. But if this stellar mass is going to increase, but it's going to go like T squared. So you're going to get a ratio of stellar mass to GMC mass, which you know, starts off low and then moves up. May move this way or that way, depending on the GMC map. It's going to move this way as far as the star lines. So maybe you can explain this range of uh, ratios. Now, the other thing is, of course, a lot of these clouds here have real ground that are bigger than one. And so my claim is those guys are never going to do anything too big. Okay? So if you're looking at a region like Taurus, it's real ground that's like 10, you know, you know, two blobs of gas in each other, they smack into each other, they started to collapse, but the rest of the gas just Blew apart, they're never going to do anything useful in Tarsus, but they're not masses. But not very few stars form in places like Tarsus. If you look at the, most of the stars are actually formed in GMCs or like 10 or 6 solar masses. In fact, it turns out that that 3 3D map, that there, half of the star formation comes from 17 little clumps in there. So most of the star formation takes place in a few places in the Milky Way. In Taurus, it's some little blob out here.
first one is you've got extremely non-spherical flows, filamentary flows, yeah. and yet you're trying to define a turbulent velocity using a spherical definition. Right. And I'm very worried that there's not actually turbulence in there that can be compressed and maybe that is repeated, but rather more or less laminar flows along filaments. That leads me to the second half of the question, which is Brown Smith, working with the group here in Heidelberg, found that uh, filamentary accretion, with most of the accretion coming down the filaments and not through the low density regions, appeared to dominate uh, star formation, bringing mass in from well outside of the initial core. And I'm wondering if that's why you're getting this long-term accretion rather than it being a long or lived clump. Right. So, two so, there. Sorry about that. No, well, that's fine. So the first thing, we did check to see, we don't actually see that most of the accretion comes in through the filaments. It's very high density, but it's very low velocity. Mm -hmm. So that may be a real difference in the actual simulation. I don't know. We yeah. did check that, because it seems like, well, you got all that density there. Why isn't that where the mass comes in? But actually, we see that most of the mass comes in not through the filaments. We saw that both in these flash runs, we saw that in Enzo as well. Okay. Which is why I thought it was okay to go ahead now to try and use this spherical approximation. Um, that's not a spherical way of I totally agree. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, smaller scales is a bit more spherical. Once you get inside the film, it's a bit more spherical. Okay. But, so is this really turbulence, or what are we actually measuring? Well, I don't know what to tell you. The answer is we did what we did, we saw this, that's what we saw. Yeah. And, and the interpretation is not straightforward because normally when you talk about turbulence, you're well, certainly if you're talking about thermal pressures, you need a separation of scales, right? You've got to be talking about forces that are bigger than the mean free path or whatever it is, okay? So what's the mean free path? Well, you take the eddy terminal to the eddy scale, which is, which is the scale we're measuring things on, right? So we have no separation of scales. So can you define turbulence? Well, we defined it. Maybe it's not turbulence, maybe it's something else. But what we're plotting is what we're plotting, and that's what we're saying. And then I agree with you, the interpretation of it is not... <laughs> so I would like to follow up on Andreas Lewis's question because I mean uh, you call it the, the convergence of the radial uh, density profile it looks very similar. You quoted in the discussion a power law minus uh, minus three yeah. This is what was the case of the shoe in the real world. The homology solution was in this. Yes. So where is the difference coming from? The difference must be the loss. Oh, it's in, in general. It's in that theory. Right. 
It will not, no, none of the spirit, spirit will collapse picture. It's not there. And we did no, not no, we have the picture. Okay, but in the pure shocks, it's well known for fluid dynamics that you will have. Oh, well, that you'll be generate turbulence. Oh, yeah, yeah. Turbulence. No, no, I'm not trying to say that we have a microscopic de description of how you drive turbulence. But using curves for the shocks is not a real thing either. This really is a 3D situation. And the, gra and the ground state that you're trying to perturb around isn't a smooth flow. It's turbulence from the get go. Okay, so you can't do a perturbation theory in the description of this. Using a smooth I'm not suggesting that you can. I just feel that in this curve shock picture, which that, that's how you think you're really breaking it. I don't think it's necessary to introduce kind of like a phenomenological picture here. And I think this is putting your finger on some physics. You know, it's, no, I think, well, so for example, the big flow coming in here, does that strike you as a curve shock? It's going to be slightly Yeah, that's, I, I've, I've worked with a mathematician on this kind of stuff, Nicholas Kevlar. There's a very elaborate theory of that. But are you starting with a slammer floor or an already fully triple? No, it's that these are See, this flow out here is fully turbulent. So you're coming in with that is only All right. So that's why I'm saying this is the hard thing to do for a patient theory. You're starting with a fully turbulent flow, right? Because it, you know, I didn't show it, so I'm like continue on out to 60 parts. Actually, you just see Lars and Blatt. So it's coming in and it's already turbulent. So but now you sort of drive it to So that's a hard problem to do with the So I, I think this is a great um, way to start discussions over dinner. Yeah. So thank you for talking about it. Let's uh, thank uh, Norman again.